Welcome back to Officially Unofficial, presented by Blue Wire Podcast. We are now joined by a very special guest, a 12-year MLB grizzled vet, two World Series appearances, World Series champ. It is my pleasure to welcome my guy, Josh Tomlin, to the Officially Unofficial Podcast. How are we? I'm doing great, man. How you doing, Johnny? Thanks for having me, by the way. I'm fired up. Like I said, when I and listen, and for the people listening to this, I want to pump my tires here a little bit. Because I was like, I, I when I posted the, uh, Ma- the episode with Matzik and Luke Jackson, it was kind of popping off, did well on the charts. And I get a follow from Josh Tomlin. And I'm like, I had to like do a double look. I was like, is that, am I getting <laughs> trolled here? Or is that the actual Josh Tomlin? So we had to get you on. And I mean, 12 years in the show, man, you've seen a lot of shit. Am I right or wrong? I mean, 12 years. No, no you're right. I have. <laughs> yeah. I, right. I so told I'm people all the time, like, uh, Houdini is not the greatest magician of all time. You throw 88 in the big leagues for that long, you got to be doing some kind of magic. Exactly. And like I said, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say you're you're like a locker room morale guy, which is what I am. You keep the boys loose and the boys love you. So, I mean, that's another thing that just keeps you in that big league locker room forever. So I want to yeah. go into the start of your career. So obviously you, you started your career in a different time now. Obviously there's not a lot of fo- like social media, cell phones, all that shit. So they must have had the rookies doing some crazy shit. So what, what, what did you do when you were a rookie for the Cleveland Indians in that 2010 season, I believe it was? What did they ha- or 2009, what did they have you doing? So first of all, was you, you, served, you served on the plane for the veterans every, every flight, every bus trip, every flight. You had the Cokes, the sodas, you know, the, the daddy beverages. You had all that <laughs> stuff, and you were the ones usually in, in some form of a costume, um, and you had a, you had the waitress, you had to, or a waiter, whatever you want to call it. You had to hold the hold the shit up, and you take it to them, and you give it to them, and things like that. But um, I remember the rookie, the rookie hazing, if you can call it hazing anymore. I'm not sure. Hoping I get canceled for that. But <laughs> the rookie hazing for that stuff, what that year was when we got to Detroit um, after the game in Detroit, night game in Detroit. Cold. They put us in underwear, Star Wars underwear, and at the time I was wearing. A cowboy hat, boots, jeans, and a shirt. The only thing in my locker was boots, the pair of underwear, and my hat. So we had to get on the bus um, in Detroit and bus to Birmingham, which is 30, 45 minutes. And get to Birmingham, they drop you off probably two miles away from the hotel and tell you to get your, get, get your ass to the hotel. So we're in underwear. There's probably about 10, 15 of us in underwear. Um, and I had boots on, and that's it. Cold as hell. And we're walking through basically downtown, the little town of Birmingham, which is a nice town, don't get me wrong. It's not downtown Detroit by any means. But um, walk from there to the hotel, and you should have seen the damn looks we were getting. <laughs> Trying to walk into bars and get to the hotel. We walk into a bar, and you're like, nah, get your asses out of here. We're not serving that. <laughs> well, listen, we're part of a team. We're playing the Tigers right now. We're just coming here for a beer to look at us. We need some beer. And they were like, no, nah, get the hell out. So we went to the hotel. The hotel wasn't having it. We're like, what the hell's about to happen? Are we about to sleep in our damn skimpies in the freaking middle of the damn Birmingham, Detroit, or uh, Michigan? Sure as shit, they let us in finally. We went to our room. It told us to go up to our room and change before we came back down to get a, um, a drink or whatever. But that was, uh, that was pretty much it. And then, you know, the next year, back then it wasn't, okay, you, you did your rookie haze and you're done. It was. Until you got to arbitration, you're doing something every single year. <laughs> so it was, it was, it wasn't hell by any means. You're in the big leagues, you're getting to enjoy life, get to go to all these cities and play against the best. So um, take it with a grain of salt and you move on. We have fun with it too, though. You don't don't get mad about it and things like that. You just have fun with it. We we enjoyed it. And dude, like, okay, so this is something that I also got to bring up here. I don't know if this is just baseball reference fucking with me, but your nick your nickname's not Little Cowboy, is it? Is that like something that like why is that, that a thing? That's, it is. I mean, it's fuck. It is to a certain extent. So my manager back in um, 2010, Manny Acta, I faced. Um, it might have been 2011. I faced Felix Hernandez and I won. <clears throat> we, I didn't pitch better than him, but I pitched with him the whole entire game. We ended up winning by one or two runs, and um, he was talking to the media that day, and they. They, um, they asked him, like, how, how impressed were you with Josh? And he's like, oh, I couldn't be more proud of my little cowboy. <laughs> and it just took off. 
And you should have seen, I mean, you should have heard the shit the guys were saying in the clubhouse about little cowboy this, little that. And I just, I finally went there at Manny. I said, Manny, what the fuck, man? Why did you, why'd you have to put little in front of it? Why you can't just see the cowboy or something like that? But from then on, it was, it stuck. It's one of the biggest sewer jobs I've ever seen. I mean, he pretty much just downsized you, like yeah. just right off the gate. And then you're getting chirps by all that kind of stuff. And we mentioned these locker rooms, right? And obviously nowadays, like, all these like there's everyone so tied in with social media and like video games and all that kind of stuff what would you say is like the biggest difference in locker rooms is it the fact that guys aren't really going out for beers after games anymore they're more focused on their i guess you could say like physical or like their appearance or their strength and skills and all that kind of stuff what what would you say like is the biggest difference now i think guys are scared of getting caught yeah in a public place with cell phone cameras everywhere nowadays when i first got to the big leagues i had cell phones to get me wrong but nobody was walking around um and the reason why I say that I know this is because I remember going to Toronto, um, speaking of your, your, your hometown, but going into Toronto, I mean, we were out till two or three o'clock in the morning one night, just having a good time. We weren't doing anything bad at all. Uh, doing what people do, big leaguers do. People that want to go to these clubs or bars and drink and have a good time. That's what we were doing. And we got in a taxi, came back home and, um, like we got, we got out and there's people around us and stuff and nobody was like taking their picture of us or putting it on social media. Like look at the Cleveland Indians out here clowning and to, to Toronto or uh, should be playing, should be, and we just got our asses kicked that night. So we we're like, you know what the hell with it? Let's go, you know, drink some beers. Hell, that was a damn good team back in 2010, but um, 11. But nobody was, it wasn't posted on social media that we were out doing that. Um, but nowadays you go into a, a restaurant, you go into a bar and, you know, you go in with a, Say you go in with a Ron Acuna or, a, uh, you know, AJ Minner with his fucked up mullet that people recognize <laughs> yeah, him, right? Yeah. So, like, he's got a uh, balding mullet. So, he's recognizable, right? You go in there, like, then the first thing they do is they, they, they start videoing you, like, hoping that you do something wrong to, 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 make to get money. you in trouble. Yeah, to, to make, make money, money right? off it. Yeah. Like, and, no and, doubt about it. And that's one thing. Obviously, I'm a big hockey guy, and I listen to a lot of hockey shows and hockey podcasts and stuff, and they say the biggest difference is – is the team bonding exercises from back then compared to now. Like back then, you would grab all the guys on a road trip. You guys would go to a bar and just get absolutely buckled or get after and just bond with each other. And nowadays, it's more, in my opinion, I believe, it's more along the lines of let's play video games together or let's just just do like off-season work. I don't know. Like, Is that the biggest thing you could also say? No, no, 100% it is. I can remember my first, oh, shit, seven years in the big leagues. it It was like that every single night. And I don't know if it's – the turnover rate in the big leagues, too, might have a big thing to do with it as well. Yeah. The, the youth coming into the big leagues and the owners not wanting to pay players past three years, like that kind of shit affects the clubhouse. It truly does. And, and I believe that. If you can't create a culture in a clubhouse, you can't create cultures in a clubhouse when you sign guys, different guys every fucking year, and ask them to mess your spring training and go. It doesn't happen. It will never happen. So – we had a core cool group of guys in Cleveland that, that came up and Atlanta was the same way. Um, and when I got there, they'd already had that core cool group that was already coming up, coming into their own. But I remember my first six, seven years in the big leagues, they would have a room. Some of the veterans that said, I'm going to name drop here for a second. Terry Wood, Jake Westbrook, guys like that would, would have rooms, have suites. And you were, it wasn't mandatory you go there, but you went there, they, they told you, hey, let, let, we're going to my, my suite after the game. We're going to drink some beers, play some cards. And that's when you got to know people then. That's when you truly got to know them. You know, you didn't go there and, you know, sit around and talk baseball the whole time. You just got to talk about every fucking thing, right? With someone's girlfriend calling them, airing them out because they, they weren't texting them back or calling them back. Like, you just find out little, you know, nuances about guys that you wouldn't find out just on normal sitting in the bullpen. You might find out about Luke Jackson, Tyler Massey, because we, you're, you're in there with them constantly. But those guys, you know, a Kerry Wood that sits in the, 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 the clubhouse or the locker room or the dugout until like the fifth or sixth inning, then comes down there, his ass is getting out there ready to go, ready to close the game out. He's not down there just bullshitting around the whole time trying to go, you know, let's do this. What are we doing tonight? This and that. It was, he went down there. He started getting loose to get it to, to save the game. So yeah. it wasn't – you truly found out about – and got to know somebody – from the inside out in, in that room. And that doesn't happen anymore. So whenever, you know, when I became, got through arbitration and signed a deal, the first thing I, I told myself is I'm getting a suite. I want a suite in my contract just for that reason alone. And we did. Everybody would come to my suite. We'd play cards all night. Um, and it's a little, 
I say it's a little bit different with Atlanta. Our team would – we would go back to our rooms we'd play video games. I've never even played a video game on PlayStation. I, was, I take that back until I got to the Atlanta Braves. You know, there's a younger group, and they all played – PlayStation, they played Call of Duty, Warzone, that kind of shit together. So in Fortnite, so I got one, and so I could play with them and get to know them and stuff. But that that really is the true. That's that's the biggest difference is you don't you're not out getting you know like you said buckled with the guys and, and having a good time and then talking about the next day. It was about how many kills did you get or uh, yeah. how'd you wreck it in Warzone <laughs> and stuff like that, which is cool. I mean, it's just a different era. That's all yeah. it is. No, you're right, and. I always say this, man. Like, I, this is obviously a joke. Like, some of it's a joke, but I wish I was like the age that I am now in like the early t- like 2010s of 2008 when you had fucking guys like Jim Leland ripping darts, like ripping cigarettes oh. in the fucking dugout. Oh, you had all the, all you, you, and then, and back in those days, you used to be able to like see a guy on the field or in the dugout and be like, that guy's hung over as fuck. Like, yeah. nowadays, it's like obviously everyone cares more about their body now and their image and all that kind of shit. So it's a little bit different, but man, those days were electric. And just obviously being a, being a younger guy, looking back on it now and seeing how much different it is compared to what it is now, you have this drive line, everyone's focusing on like their, like their body, all that kind of stuff. It's just a massive difference, dude. So it is massive difference. No doubt about it. And and it's not that the product is suffering, but the product has gotten so good on the field. And don't get me wrong. It was, it was fucking amazing back then. I, I personally believe that was a better time of baseball. And I'm not sure why the, at the, the talent level right now in baseball is outrageous. Yeah. But the game is slowing down. So you don't get to see, you don't get to see, see the guys huffing and puffing at second base or a guy, you know, the David Wells sweating the, sweating the alcohol off his fucking forehead. And the Mark Burley's doing this shit, wiping keystone lights off their damn forehead <laughs> because they were out all night, you know? Yeah. You don't see that very often anymore. And there, don't get me wrong, there's still a few of the, of the rare breeds around, but um, it's, 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 you're right, it's not the same. And, you know, granted, back then you could go, you could go out to have a bender till 6 a.m. and then, you know, pop a greenie and go play. Yeah. But, you know, now it's a little bit different. You can't yeah. do that shit anymore. No, you're 100% right. And, dude, like, and that, you mentioned that 2010 Cleveland team, and I got to bring this up because, uh, Obviously, Cleveland's not too far from Toronto, so I used to go down to those games all that time, all the time there. And my favorite player growing up, I, I'd be pissed off. I didn't ask you about this, Grady Sizemore. What was oh, this man. dude like, man? I mean, obviously, it it just breaks my heart that he had a short career with injuries, and Lord knows what happened to him. But man, when that guy was in his prime, when he was playing, holy shit, he was special, dude. I mean, they don't make him like Grady Sizemore anymore. Period. What was it like period. playing with that dude? What was it like playing with that dude? Well, I didn't get a chance to truly – I got a chance to play with him for a few months of each year, but it wasn't – I didn't get to see Grady Sizemore be Grady Sizemore. I was in the minor leagues, and I'd go to these games and watch him. But when I got there, he was on the tail end – or actually the beginning of – beginning of the end for Grady, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and Grady got a bad rep. I, I People would – I say a bad rep. Grady didn't have a bad rep at all. An outstanding human being, hell of a player, hell of a teammate. But – People would ask me on other teams, hey, is Grady soft? Like, what the hell is it? Like, no. This son of a bitch had a damn micro fracture knee repair, and then he blew a – had a sports hernia and blew a quad or blew a hernia um, or groin, whatever the hell it was, blew it out, then hurt his other knee and had to do it all over again. And I remember watching him blow his quad – or his quad or his groin going around first base. He just hit a ball probably 150 miles an hour off the fucking wall. And – snap hook that little short arm snap hook swing top spin off the wall he's rounding he's rounding first guy gets it off the i think it was against uh baltimore guy uh, i think it marquette gets played off the wall and turns and throws it to the second base so grady's having to shit and get a little bit to get there and he and he pulls his quad growing wherever it was and the son of a bitch just just wears it and just re- he dives for fucking second base and gets there and he's safe and we're just over here going holy shit and I asked the trainer, I'm like, what was that his knee? No, nah, it wasn't his knee. And um, it ended up being his groin. A couple of weeks go by, he's rehabbing. He's walking on the track, trying to get back sooner, quicker, uh, quicker than the timetable was. But it was just amazing watching this guy go from the top, playing 162 games every year for like four or five, three or four or five years in a row, something like that. And then watching an injury 
just completely change how Grady Stauffer played the game. He had he tried to play it cautiously so he could be healthy. It just didn't work for him. It doesn't work for him. It didn't work for guys like that. My dad used to tell me all the time, if you go play football, play football with a fuck you attitude, essentially. Yeah. Because if you play timid, you play scared, you're going to get hurt. You can't step, you're going to get hurt. And it's kind of how things started kind of unraveling for Grady. But Grady's one of the toughest sons of bitches I've ever played with. Dude. He it- tried playing through it all. Every once in a while, man, I'll watch his, uh, I'll watch his like highlight tapes on YouTube or something like that. And God damn, bro. I mean, this guy, holy, Freak. if he, if he got a full, like a full scale career or something along those lines, like minimal injury, he would have been something special, man. I mean, I looking hmm. back on that in that time in Cleveland. And the crazy thing is like, he had such a short career and he still looked upon like borderline Jersey retirement in Cleveland. I could be wrong on that, but he was, no, a no, I think there. it should be. Yeah. I think it should be. He was. He was the face of baseball for a few years that – and the most underrated face of baseball, and he wasn't underrated. But I yeah. feel that's how good he was. He was – the only thing that – only knock that Grady Sizemore had was they didn't make it to the playoffs enough with Grady Sizemore, in my opinion. Yeah. Right? Or they didn't win one with Grady Sizemore. Because he was the most electric player I've ever seen in person, on TV – that, that I've ever, I've ever, and I've played with Lindor, Jose Ramirez, Michael Brantley, um, you know, Shane Bieber, these guys. Like, I've played with guys that are freaking phenomenal. Mike Napoli, you know, just outrageous talents, right? And he was by far, he was by far the most like, oh, my God, this dude is, if there was a league, he'd be in the league with Mike Trout if yeah. there was a different league. That's what it was. Yeah. Oh, man, it sucks. But and the next guy I got to bring up is another guy. When I think back in the day when I was going to these Cleveland Indians games, is a guy that just used to fucking launch baseballs and look like he packed the biggest dips of all time. Maybe he didn't. Travis fucking Hafner. <laughs> Holy shit. This oh. dude was fucking electric. Oh, my God, dude. He – half half would have to do – he would have – half when half's back started hurting him, watching him go through a, a, a warm-up or a, a the pregame trying to get ready to play was incredible. But that son of a bitch did it. He was – Watching him hit balls in BP and hit balls in the games was like, oh, he got fooled. No, he didn't hit that bitch 500 feet. What the hell just happened? It would look like he would get fooled or he would just be like, he'd see a, he'd see a curveball and he'd be like, oh, shit, shit. And he'd front foot it and he'd go, it'd go in the second, second, second row or second row, second level in right field. And they called it Pronksville for a reason. And I, you've been to Cleveland. You know how big that stadium is. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't easy to hit the ball out of the ballpark there at one time. Now it's a launching pad, but right center field, there was a, a, a row of seats below right, the um, uh, right field bleachers going up, and then there was another row above that that was – you look at it, and you lost your BP, and nobody's hitting balls up there. And we're going, what in the – what the shit is going on? <laughs> and that's no way Travis had to pepper balls up there. And grading them with Travis Blight, yeah, I did. The hell I didn't. The most dry humor you've ever met in your life, but – absolutely fucking hilarious all the time that's one of those guys when you look back on guys that you wish got rings it was travis hafner i mean this guy got about it he grinded his big league career he was just dh'ing like for a long period of time like would never step foot on the field all he'd have to worry about is hitting and this guy would just launch and that year and that year you mentioned what he had back issues the guy still hit 280 like it's not like he was just some sort of yeah, scrub right. on the field. I mean, what, what what was he like in the locker room? Was he just like a quiet guy, or was he letting that shit eat, or was he loose? No, no, he was a quiet guy. Travis, Travis was a quiet guy. He would let you know when he had to. He was that kind of presence. He was that kind of presence, that stoic a pre- presence. Like you don't want to go talk to him unless you have to. That kind of guy. But once you got to know him, um, he was harmless. He really was. He was just a big giant from. I think North Dakota, I think what it was. North Dakota, South Dakota, something like that. And he looked he looked the part of a North Dakota or whatever. Yeah, you, North what Dakota. Yeah. yeah. Dude. And he looked the part. It had some of the best hunting grounds up there, I'm sure. But um, we used to ask him all the time. But he would um no, he wasn't the guy that would be like, you know, if if I was sitting on a leather couch from there and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Get the hell out. He wasn't that kind of guy. He would just walk over and tap him on the shoulder, and be like, hey, don't sit on that. Okay. Yeah, hey. You ain't got to tell me twice. <laughs> so, 
So who was like the leader on that? Like on those like early 2010 teams, obviously like you guys like kept getting those massive rookie stars, like as Drew Cabrera, you got Jason yeah. Kipnis, you had Michael Brantley you had all these guys. Right. So at what point, like who was that vo like, uh, vocal leader or that guy that led by example? I think Hafner was that guy, but we didn't have, we didn't have, we didn't have, a, and I hate saying this because it's not, it's not a knock on anybody. It's just a knock on kind of how the, the, the system was starting in Cleveland then, right? Where the turnover rate, the, the not tanking, but tanking, right? Yeah. It was, we're going to get rid of these guys because we can't afford them anymore, but these young guys are going to come up and we're going to give them the reins eventually. So they would go out and sign a Jason Jambi or a um, Mike Napoli. Johnny until, Damon. Johnny yeah. Damon, Derek Lowe, guys like that. Derek Lowe was the vocal – he was a vocal guy back in the day. But back 2010, 11, and 12, we didn't really have anybody that was that just loud, you know, guy in the locker room. You know, we were told to turn the TVs off at 630 to get ready for a game, which is not, that's not how it is. But um, Hacker was the leader in that clubhouse, bar none. Him and Grady Sizemore were bar none. But – they weren't the kind of guys, they led by example. They didn't lead by, you know, calling guys out or doing things like that. It was just constant business by them. Uh, it wasn't said there was no fun in the clubhouse by any means. We had a damn good time. But it was just basically those guys weren't going to sit there and babysit your ass and tell you what, what you can and can't do. If you fucked up, they told you, period. And you, and you learned from it. You didn't, you didn't question it or you didn't do it again, period. And that's another whole other thing that was, is going on in baseball that – it's hard to tell somebody, hey, you can't do this because they don't like it. Well, I don't give a shit. This is the way I do it. Well, I understand that. But you're going to step on people's toes and you're going to do this, you're going to do that. They don't give a fuck. Some, some people don't give a fuck yeah. anymore. No, that right? They don't give a shit about the tradition or anything like that, which is fine. I understand that aspect of it too. But, um, you know, then we got Derek Lowe who never shuts the fuck up, <laughs> but in a good way, right? He's, he's awesome. He's hilarious. But he's just a talker. He loves to talk. And um, so once we got him, things kind of lightened up a little bit. And then um, when Tito got there in 13, that's when it all kind of – It all started – oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's – that's um, if, no, if, you don't, if you've never had a chance to play with Tito or have a conversation with that man, everybody, I think, should. It's absolutely you, – you'll be on your knees laughing your ass off or – You'll be going. Oh, what the fuck? Are you serious? <laughs> and one of the two. One of the two. And it's an, all in a good way too. Yeah, dude. And Jordan Luplo told me about that because uh, I'm obviously we're really close with Jordan Luplo on the pod, and he said like Tito's one of those guys where he's a legit national treasure in the game of baseball. I mean, he won those sure. World Series with the. I mean, he was. He's that guy you look on that where it's like he's still old school, but he's adapted to the new school where being more of like a player friendly coach where it's like. Be a little, not like a little bit more soft with the players, but like understanding where players are coming from nowadays compared to back in the day. So what yeah. would you say is like your favorite T Tito or Terry Francona story that you have in your career or just something that he did where it's like, this is Tito right here. Oh shit. Go play cards with the guy for one day. And I'll, I'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. We, we, we sit in his office. This is, this is how different it was once we got Tito. He would tell you, he'd see us playing cards in the clubhouse. He'd walk through there. And it was my first time in a big league locker room understanding what big league, when, when I would hear what player managers were. He'd walk through a clubhouse and say, hey, bring that deck of cards or bring your fucking wallet. <laughs> I'm like, hmm? What? He's like, get your ass in here. Let's play. Then he'd teach us cribbage. We'd play cribbage with him. Um, and it, it wasn't, you, you couldn't play until you had, until you, until you were like, okay, I, I, here, hundred bucks. I'm gonna kick your ass. Okay, here, hundred bucks. Let's play. Like that was until you could get to that level of doing that. He wasn't gonna play with you. Um, but Tito put uh, Michael Brantley could attest to this, and Tito actually mentioned on MLB Network, I think, one day. Um, the son of a bitch. We're sitting there in his uh, office playing cribbage, me, him, and Brantley. And I get up to go get a, a water or go get my dip or whatever it was. Go in there and get it. Come back. He's got a shitty and grin on his face. He's always got a shitty and grin on his face um, when you're playing cribbage with him. But um, I start drinking my coffee, and he's over there kind of like, yeah, ha. And I finish my coffee, and this damn turd of chew hits me in the top of my lip. 
And I said, what the fuck is that? I looked down. It's his damn wad of bubble gum and chew in the bottom of my damn coffee cup. <laughs> Little bitty Gatorade. And it hits me in the top of my damn lip. I said, what the shit? And then him and Brantley lose their shit. They just start laughing their asses off at me. I almost puked. I'm, about, I'm turning green. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what's worse. Did that, that chew hit me? Or did I drink some of your fucking spit, you know? <laughs> there ain't no telling what the hell's in your system. <laughs> what and, a legend. Oh, dude. And I was, he's laughing his ass off. And so, like, I wait a couple weeks. I said, I'm going to get to some of this back. So I see his Lancaster's chew over there. So I go get my water. I take the water out of my mouth. And I go throw it in there. I grab his bag and I shake that shit up. And you get all the grains <laughs> and stuff in there. And he goes in there and gets his chew. And you can tell he's like, huh. Kind of moist. What the hell is a moist for? <laughs> but he gets his gum. He does all of his shit. He puts his chew in there. He starts chewing it. And I can see him going. <sighs> <sighs> like there's grains going in the back of his throat now. And he takes that shit out. He's halfway green. And I'm kind of nervous because it's probably a fifth, sixth inning and we're, we're losing. And he's got to go. And he's got to go make a pitching change. I'm going, oh, <laughs> shit. Oh, shit. I'm about to get my ass chewed out here. But he, he takes it out. He kind of wobbles. He wobbles to the mound, gets there, comes back, and he's like, Tizzle, I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and I just lose my shit. And we all just start laughing. He starts laughing there. Bills, he starts laughing. And it was a great time. But um, he was that kind of guy. He is that kind of guy still to this day. Like he, and he, he'll dish it out with the best of them, but he can take it even better, which makes him awesome, in my opinion. Like, if you can't, if you're going to dish it out, you better be able to then well take it just as much as you can dish it out. And, and he could. And if you look, good. yeah, and if you look at those Cleveland teams, I mean, the records going into like your 2010 season, it just continues to grow and grow. And then when you guys hit that next level, like these guys are elite, was when Tito got there, man. I mean, you yeah. want to talk? What was like the first thing? And if you were there, I mean, if you were in that clubhouse, what was like the first thing he said in spring training to you guys, where you're like, all right, like this is we got our guy here, like we got a guy that's going to take us to like the promised land. I think the belief that he has in us, and like in this, the belief that he has in the system that he created, right? It's it's not, hey, Lindor, you're the best shortstop in the league. Just go do your thing. It was, hey, we're going to make mistakes in the bases, but we're going to make good mistakes in the bases. We're going to make aggressive mistakes in the bases. We're going to have to play the game right and hard all the time. And it wasn't, we're going to throw strikes. We're going to have to, you know, fill our position well. Uh, we're going to do the little things right to be able to win. If we have a bunt play called, get the, get the damn bunt down. If they have a pitch out called, know the signs. It was little things because he knew we weren't a big payroll team. If we didn't, he came from Boston where they'd, you know, give him an empty che- a blank checkbook and say, go do what you got to do. It wasn't like that in Cleveland. He understood that. That's, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why he took the job. But yeah. Tito made a point to say, I'm going to get to know each and every one of you on a personal level so I know how to get the best out of each one of you. And he did. And he didn't. That's not a cop out. That's not a, you know, you know, there's, there's people that say that and there's people that do that. And he did that. He did it all the fucking time. He, he would sit down with, you know, a rookie Jose Ramirez as he would with Mike Napoli. He would do the same shit with them that he would with each other. And he trusted his veterans to police the clubhouse. He wasn't going to go in there and say, Hey, you know, do this. He would say, Hey, you know, I see something going on in the clubhouse. What do you got? Like, I got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that was the end of it. He would never question it or micromanage it. Um, and also, it was very, very evident that the man was prepared every single day, more prepared than anybody you can ever think of on, on a field. He had the amount of notes that he had on his clubhouse before a game going over them every second that he was playing cribbage, shuffling cards, wherever you were looking at them, was, it was uncanny. Dude was prepared. And you, could, and you knew that going into it. He had his shit taped up on the wall. He had his uh, notes in his hand, but I asked him one time, I said, Tito, what the hell, how do you know what the hell's coming? He said, you, you try to prepare for three innings in advance, or you try to know what's going to happen three innings in advance. That way you're not behind. He said, play every game like you're three innings in advance. That way you're not behind when the time comes, because if you're, if you're right on time or a tad bit late, the game's lost. It could be lost in that instance. And I'm like, holy shit. So he's always prepared. He's always looking ahead to try to be one step in front of either the manager or in front of what's going to happen next. Yeah. No, you're I, it's crazy to see like the evolution of the team that you were on and stuff. And speaking about evolution there though, I mean, 
the Cleveland fans are fucking psychopaths. So as you guys <laughs> kept getting better and better and progressive field kept getting more packed and more packed, oh, yeah. it was like, I'm watching these games. Like the baseball world's watching these games and saying, holy shit. Like, first of all, people don't realize how big that stadium is. It is fucking massive. It's massive. And another thing is, is like those fans, when they, when you put a good product on the field, they're legit. Like that's all they have is them, the Browns and the, and the Cavs, right? They're psychopaths. Right. So what was it right. like? What, what was your first experience or, what was like the best atmosphere you played in there where it's like, I can't even hear myself fucking think right now. It, so I remember Derek Lowe telling me in 2012, he said, I hope you get to, I hope you get a chance to play in a playoff game in a progressive field. It's the loudest place I've ever played in my life. And for me at that time, that was 2012. I'd only been a part of a few sellouts and they were Friday night fireworks. That's it. We hadn't been in the playoffs yet. We got to the playoffs and I remember I think it was, uh, it was, it was, you gotta be 13 when we first made the playoffs, a wild card game. Yeah. I was hurt. I wasn't active, but we were down from the get go. So it wasn't as loud. It was loud. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't as loud as whenever I got there in 16. We got to the playoffs in 16. And I can just remember we were playing Toronto, we were playing Boston first, thinking to myself, holy shit. I didn't pitch in Cleveland that time I pitched the last game in, in Fenway, the first game we played there. Um, but I, I remember sitting in the dugout. I'm going, holy shit. I, told, I asked Kluber when he came off the field. I said, how was that? He was like, holy shit, dude, that was fun as fuck. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> I was like, damn, that's, that's awesome. I said, I couldn't even hear anything in this damn dugout. He goes, oh, you think that? He goes, wait till you get on the field. He said, it's electrifying. Dude. You'll, it's the greatest experiential experience on a baseball field. And I said, all right. Then I go to Boston, and I experienced that crowd. Well, then I pitched against Toronto in – Blue Jays in Cleveland the next round at a, on a 3.30 game. Cold as shit, but it was sunny. It didn't, wasn't that cold. But the fans, I can just remember thinking to myself, like, if, if, there's, a bump, if there's a bump play, the guy on first and second, if, if, if uh, Gomer Yon starts telling me one, one or one or two, 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 or three, 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 I don't, I'm not fucking hearing him. I, I got I yeah. to think about this shit before it happens because you, the, the, it was like, the decimal level in there was was it was it was deafening. It was absolutely, and I thought the damn whole shit was just going to pile in on you. And like you said, nobody understands. I don't think people truly feel like, or understand, haven't been to Progressive Field, how big it is because it is. It's massive. It is a massive stadium, and they're right on top of you. It kind of reminds me of like old Yankee Stadium, how the shit goes up, and they feel like everybody feels like they're right on top of you. It was yeah. wild, dude. But it it was um, <clears throat> then in the um, World Series. Uh, the 22 game win streak, also by the way, was pretty freaking nutty. Yeah, dude, holy shit. That um, I mean, when Jay Bruce hit that walk off that game, that was absolutely incredible because that was like the closest thing to playoffs we were going to get to that year, and um, before we actually got to the playoffs, and it was absolutely insane, absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah, and and you're speaking about that playoff series, and I got a kind of a gripe to pull here because I think this was the series when this happened. Obviously, I'm a big Blue Jays fan. Obviously, I'm the face of Blue you Jays. You Clevenger. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking about, and I believe it was Trevor Bauer. Is it correct? I, I don't know who it was. Was it Bauer or Clevenger? Some clown show, with all due respect, because obviously Clevenger's boys with Musgrove was my guy. Some clown show wipes a Blue Jays rally towel on his ass, and I was like 18. I was like, I want this man dead. Like I was just <laughs> full. I was full small. I was like, I want this man mur like assassinated. Who did that? Was it Bauer? Who did that? Do you I don't that? know. I don't. I don't remember that. It, if I had to guess, it would probably be Bauer. To do something like that okay i'm gonna pull this I don't up remember i thought you were about to talk about the balk whenever clevenger was in the wind up with what, bases what loaded. was that what happened there i don't even remember that uh, i think it was i think it was toronto it might have been yeah if it was eddie edwin Encarnacion was swinging it was hitting i think yes oh you know what but, you know what? we we have this all mixed up that was Derek holland that did that so fuck Derek holland that, we're all good here. We're all so fuck Derek Collin now. So we're all good. But I know there was something that happened in that series. And you're mentioning the Bach. I, I think it's coming back to me. Was that at the Rogers Center where that happened? I no, no, that was the Cleveland. That was in Cleveland. The other, the Trevor Bauer incident, and I, I, I brought it up to our trainers in um, Atlanta because they were in Toronto at the time. Was Trevor Bauer pitched in Toronto um, because it was the uh, yes, pinky the, the shit, drones, the drone the drones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I but Clevenger, that. I think, was in Cleveland. And at the time, you didn't have to specify whether you were in the whether in the wind up or the balk. They didn't have this hybrid stretch yes. wind up bullshit like that. But Clevenger did. Um, but they didn't have 
They didn't have, they didn't come out there and ask you, hey, you're in the stretch of the windup because they ask you that shit now. Um, it's juvenile, but whatever. Um, and Clevenger was in his windup and Clevenger can't stand still in the, in the, in yeah, the, um, that, on the mound. He has so he was like rocking yeah. back and forth with his foot. Well, Eddie, Eddie fucking pulled, throws his hands up. It was like, balk, balk. And Clevenger fucking boom, throws a strike. <laughs> it was like, holy shit. That, and so then he's, everybody's yelling, step off, step off. I mean, the whole shit, I didn't even know exactly that he went to. I think he ended up going, he ended up going to the uh, stretch after the fact. But, and I don't know if he actually even balked, to be honest with you. But they were saying he balked because he was making movements. But it was his natural wind up so there's so many fucking rules that that, that yeah. you know people don't know about and even players don't even freaking know about but um that was the whole incident there but um yeah when bauer was in um he toronto, was hated bro i i, I oh, remember God. that everyone hated him it's like and the toronto fans as you know are fucking ruthless like they oh, don't get they're, they're amazing, crazy is what they are yeah i love i mean obviously and and talking about that atmosphere because not many guys i've had on this pod were on the other side of that dugout we've had guys that played in that game and all that stuff but what was it like being a visitor at the rogers center because obviously we've been waiting for playoff baseball here for a long time during that time period we never had a good team since like 94 or whatever it was 93 right. so the fans there were like and the, and the leafs weren't good so like there, there was not really any good sports teams that's all we had what was that atmosphere like being on the opposing side? We were hoping. So we played a 16 inning game there that year too, I think on Canada day. Yeah. And it was loud as hell. And the roof was open, I think, but we were just praying the roof was open. So it didn't keep them, keep the yeah. noise in. It was not. That bitch was closed from the get <laughs> jump, jump straight. And it was loud as hell. Um, it was, it was weird because you could – Canadians are loud. They are loud. And each voice carried its own weight. So you could, like, hear people being like, fuck you, or, hey, son of a bitch, like, I hope you – or strike out or, or ball. <laughs> yeah. or, you can hear everything. But it was just like a sea of – sea of blue at the time. They had these towels and shit, and they were just – you could tell they were, thir- they were starving for a championship in baseball. They were starving for baseball greatness, and they had the team to do it. We just had a better one at the time. Yeah. No offense. But, no, you did. Um, and overall team, players-wise, there's no question about it. Y'all had, on paper, that was the best team. That was the best team I ever faced in baseball, period. Donaldson, Bautista, you know, you had freaking um, Adam Land, I think, was there. Um, Donaldson. It was had, I mean, It was Goings insane. was freaking – you didn't yeah. even have pitch Estrada. You had these pitchers that were uh, – Aaron San- Sanchez. Like, you had guys that were freaking unhittable and that could – you couldn't shock them out, but um, no, that place was electric, man. It was it was a fun place to play. I'm not gonna lie, but I I will say that I think I think Gibby and um, the trainers messed up by taking Bauer out of that game. Um, you got to our strength, you know. Our bullpen was our strength at that time. Yeah, you know, our starters were good. Don't get me wrong, but you got Andrew Miller, Brian oh Shaw, Cody Allen, <laughs> just Andrew Miller, waiting in the wind to come into the game. Oh, Andrew Miller. <laughs> Holy fuck. That guy's good. And he's still, yeah, I mean, I think he's still, man. he's still kicking around, man. I mean, that guy's still yeah. doing the thing, bro. I mean, so you were there during the Andrew Miller, like prime prime where he was like legitimately unhit up. Like no one could touch this dude. What was yeah. it? What, what was your standpoint seeing this guy come into the league? His wind up is bananas. You can't see the ball as a, I don't know how some guys set up this dude, but what was it like being teammates with this guy? How he prepared? Did you know he was going to be that good going into spring training? And when he got called up, what was that like? Well, the son of a bitch came up a home run to Joe Mauer in the very first batty face. We, um, we we got him. And I was like, holy shit, dude, are we going to get a bus? <laughs> and I even told that to him one time. But no, he was, his locker was out next to mine. Outstanding human being. Um, loves the game, loves his teammates. Was He was just – he was driven. You could tell he was driven to be great. He was – he had this, you know, had this sigma on him for years about being this hot top end, you know, front front line starter for years to come. Um, going to be the next Randy Johnson type guy, whatever. It didn't work out. He knew it didn't work out. He and he was fi- he was completely fine with it. But he he found the niche in the bullpen, and I found the niche with the fucking slider is what he did. But he was just, I mean. He could throw three innings one day and throw 15 pitches and Tito would be like, hey, you're going to be down today. But now I'm ready. I'm good. I'm good to go. It didn't matter. Abusing, using, 
fourth inning, ninth inning, 15th inning. It didn't make a shit to Andrew Miller. And that was evident. He didn't give a flying shit when he pitched. He changed the game, in my opinion. He changed the game, what relievers are meant to do now. He's old school in a sense of he was a multi-inning guy. But he wasn't a multi-inning guy for saves. He was a multi-inning guy. What, the most, what Tito thought was the most important part of the game, he used Andrew Miller. No matter if it was fourth inning or if there was bases loaded two outs, he'd bring Andrew Miller in the fourth inning, get that guy out, and then he'd go fifth, sixth. And then it was Shaw, Cody Allen. And how, he, how Tito used him was absolutely brilliant. But, no, Grasshopper used to walk around with a golf ball, and he'd always rub his toes and shit out and all that kind of stuff. And I'd, I'd always give him a hard time, like, dude, you're chasing demons, aren't you? He'd be like, don't talk about about <laughs> demons. <laughs> Just, like, little shit like that. He was – but now standing, he's, he still is. I mean, he's, he's awesome. I still talk to Drew. But um, he'd be down there in the fifth inning every single game, and he'd do his little towel drill on the mound. He'd get up there and go through his whole towel drill. And I'm sure their teams are going like, what the hell is this dude doing? You know, but he'd come in and he'd throw three sliders and strike you out. He's, he's the guy that I think if electronic strike zone came into play, he'd be he went to Cy Young throwing 80 innings a year. He's, I mean, this guy. And do you feel like – Obviously, some pitchers get some sort of sense of pride when they're in Andrew Miller's position where it's like, we're going to move you move you to the bullpen. Have you seen that throughout your career where guys are like, no, I'm not pitching out of the fucking bullpen. I'm a starter. Has that happened? Like, you've seen that before? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you hear guys all the time, like, I'm a starter. I'm not a bullpen guy. I'm like, hmm, you're not, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell – I had this conversation with AJ Minner not too long ago, actually. He – um. He throws three innings in a uh, playoff game, and don't get me wrong, fucking phenomenal three innings uh, against NLCS against the Dodgers. Strike out seven, something like that, was, was, was ridiculous. And you hear him the next offseason say, I, I think I can be a starter. You have two pitches, bro. No, you can't. Yeah. You might be able to, to last a few innings, but I said, won't you turn yourself into Andrew Miller? And he did. He has. But it was, it was like, hey, don't don't discount yourself as a bullpen guy, man. Like bullpen guys, it's not enough. It used to be just nothing but failed starters going on the bullpen and then they'd make up for a sure. Bullpen. It's not like that anymore. The reason why you're in pitching the seventh or eighth inning, AJ, is because you're fucking good. You're unhittable. You're electric. It, you have a low pulse. Like your heartbeat stays even keel. And you can make a shitload of money doing that. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Starters get paid a lot more money, but hell, closers get paid a shitload of money, and Andrew Miller got paid a shitload of money to do what he was doing. The innings don't – the save is not – it's not as valuable as it used to be, in my opinion. You don't have Marion, you don't have the Mariano Rivera's on the team anymore. Who, the ninth inning is his, period. You have matchups more so than anything else now. Exactly. So holds are just as well – just as much as important or just as valuable as saves are nowadays. Maybe not an arbitration process. I get it, but um, – Holds, I mean, look at Luke Jackson, that son of a bitch, Tyler Matzik. They weren't closing games out. Don't get me wrong. Will Smith was locked down for us last year. But um, Luke Jackson, Matzik, freaking mentor, if it weren't for those three guys, you could have – Will Smith would be the first to tell you, if it weren't for those three guys holding the line until he got the ball, he wouldn't have the saves he had. He just wouldn't. And those guys deserve just as much credit as, as Will. And I'm sure Mariana tell you the same thing about Jabba, the wetlands, and all that shit of the world, too. Yeah. It's, the save is just, hey, I got the ball in the ninth inning. We were up by three or less. Yeah, true. And you mentioned you mentioned Jabba Chamberlain. Holy fuck. What, I haven't heard that name in so long. He, <laughs> he I just aged myself a little bit? No, he took, the, he took the baseball world by legitimate storm, man. I mean, I remember that guy was, like, in the show for, like – or he was in, he had, like, a short time period. And obviously it was, like it, – it, it added a little bit to him being on the Yankees. But holy fuck. I mean, when that guy was on the Yankees, he was nasty. Like, he was oh, insane. I watched the clip of him today, whatever, doing 99, like he was, like – just yeah. yeah like he was tired yeah he was and, incredible yeah and, and speaking about incredible i mean i gotta bring this up because this is my guy like i had matt i had matzik on when he was trying to crack the atlanta braves like i've been boys with them for god like three four years now so talking about his his playoff performance last year was that the biggest ballsy like big dick performance you've ever fucking oh, seen oh my god oh dude it, the yes. whole playoffs the whole playoffs Dude, he just sacked the fuck up. That's all he did. From a guy that 
and, and, and this is no knock on Tyler Mask by any means. From a guy that was fighting for a job to doing what he's doing now, it tells you a lot about this and that and his fucking heart and his nuts. Tyler yeah. nuts sack. It's this guy was on his way out of the game, man. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, we saw him the year before in spring training before the shortened season. And then the shortened season came and they had him over in the Bushes locker room um, at spring training in um, at, in Atlanta. And this guy comes out and throws a, a simulated game. And but, but look, well, what the fuck? <laughs> what is he doing over here? What is he doing over there? That dude has no business being over there. Throwing 98 99 freaking spring training and hammers, absolute freaking hammers. And we were like, holy shit, dude. And we, so we talked talk, talking to Walt about him. He was like, oh, dude, dude's a stud. He's a stud. He's a great human being, also a stud. Because um, Walt had him in uh, Colorado, a first round draft pick and all that shit. And then once I kind of understood his story a little bit, he started telling me he had the, had the thing. Yeah. I was like, I get it now. I, I, I've seen I've seen the thing ruin a guy before that I thought was a surefire big leaguer going to be, you know, a back-end guy for a long period of time, and he couldn't throw the first base, and next thing you know, he's done. Done, done. Um, and he graduated from Princeton, like a smart, smart son of a bitch, um, which just goes to show you that it doesn't matter if you're dumb, smart, you know, intelligent, whatever, whatever you want to call it. If you, if you, you have this mental block, it's, uh, it's damn near impossible to come out of, and he did. He fucking did. And to his credit, he deserves every bit of recognition and, and praise and honor and um, recognition that he was getting from that because he worked his absolute dick into the dirt to try to get that, and he, he finally fucking got it. And speaking about, like, just obviously all that, like the, the careers and all that stuff, I got to go into a, a little part of yours here. So, obviously, you had a lot of success early on, and then you kind of struggled that year. Then you came back just balls of fucking hanging. Then after the 2013 season, I believe it was, you had, like, a sub-4-3 ERA, all that kind of stuff. When, like, did you have a humbling moment in the big leagues where it's like, all right, man, there is maybe some shit that I have to work on, or maybe I'm a bit too cocky on the bump, or maybe my mindset's not right? Like, when did you have that, like, f switch? I see I, my switch was on from the time I, I got in the pole ball because I knew where I stood. I was fortunate enough to be able to have friends back here that had played the big leagues, that had played in the minor leagues, and had played at the top of their game and played against some of the top um, people in the world. So, I knew from the get-go I was going to have to do all the little things right and be very, very good in the minor leagues to get my shot. Um, I knew the not, – not politics, but I knew the – I knew that if they didn't have anything invested in me, which they did not have shit invested in me, then I wasn't going to be looked at in the same light as our first-rounders were that year or even our top ten-rounders, right? I wasn't going to be looked at the same way. Um, to the point where our, actually my first pitch coach I ever had called me lefty. And I said, what the hell are you call me lefty for, Kenny? He's like, because if you were left-handed, you wouldn't be with me right now. <laughs> He'd be somewhere else. I said, that's shit, I know. <laughs> but I, I got it, dude. Once I got to the pro ball and I see some of these Latin guys throwing 98 miles an hour and I see some of these American guys that were drafted in the first round throwing 94 to 96, like, I was like, what the, what am I doing here? I have no business being here. But I knew what I did well. I knew exactly what I did well. I knew I could throw the ball where I want to throw the ball, and I keep guys off the barrel. And at the time, strikeouts weren't sexy as shit. They weren't anything. It was just don't walk somebody, throw the son of a bitch down and away, keep the ball in the yard, and go from there. Challenge guys. Don't walk them. It's okay. So I did that. And fortunately, I, I had good years in minor leagues. I was, um, you know, I always started the year in the bullpen. I ended up making my way as a starter but um, in the minor leagues. But that – that mindset of me competing was, has always been there, man. It was, um, that's going to be the hardest thing in the world for me to do when I retire is not being able to compete in the clubhouse with, with guys like fucking playing cards, um, playing video games, whatever the case may be, and competing on the mound. That, that to me is what drives, that's the love I have for the game is being able to compete against the very, very fucking best. I love every aspect of it. I want to see how my shit plays out. I've always been that way. And my numbers will tell you that because I have given up more home runs than I've given up walks. I was career. just about to say that. That is one <laughs> of the most fucking absurd <laughs> stats I've ever read. It doesn't make I any sense. I said that to the bullpen one time. And Matzik and, and Luke and Mint, they are like, there's no fucking way. I'm like, I, I promise you, dude. <laughs> I promise you. I used to give up shitload of home runs, dude. And I still do give up a lot of home runs. for. But I, my whole thing was if I can give up a home run, Here's, 
here's my argument to what guys say. Who gives who gives a fuck about walks? All right. Home runs are a historic high. Uh, historic high. Walks are historic high and strikeouts are historic high. I don't strike guys out. I do not. As my screen name will tell you, my Activision thing, Tommy Tupac. I strike out two people whether I go nine innings or whether I go one inning. Period. That's how it is. It's just how it fucking goes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Darren O'Day gave that nickname, by the way. But <laughs> I said that. And, but my whole thing was if I go to Vegas and I have 70% odds, I'm going to get a guy out or I'm going to win millions of dollars. I'm taking those damn odds every single time, right? Yeah. The greatest hitter of all time is going to be 300. Hall of Fame hitters are 300. There's only been one person in the history of the world, history of the game, that ever hit 400. Why would I not take my damn odds, take, take my chances? Because, and obviously those chances are increased and decreased by the counts you're in. You know, 00 count is significantly about median, medium range. But then 01, guys are hitting like 080. 1-0, they're hitting like 350. Yeah. I knew those, I knew that freaking math. I knew that, I knew those odds. And hell, it's the hitter advantage counts or a pitcher advantage count. You can tell me the numbers all day long, but it's pretty self-explanatory. I hit, I used to hit, fuck, I know. I'd be much rather be in a 1-0, 2-0 count than I would be a 0-1 or a 0-2 count all day long. It's it, like I said, and that's a stat. And obviously nowadays with the amount of walks and uh, home runs that people give up, that might be one of the only stats that is just never going to get broken. Like it <laughs> legitimately, it's crazy. If you, you own, and you can look back on this and obviously you're going to have grandkids. You could tell your grandkids, you have like, you were the only pitcher in baseball history, the history of the game from like the 1800s to have more home runs than fucking walks. It is <laughs> mind boggling, man. Still in 88. Yeah, Some it, people think I'm crazy. And by all, I probably am crazy. But then Michael Brandis tell me all the time, is like, stop throwing the bench on the middle. I'm like, it's three out, three one, who gives a fuck? He's like, no, obviously you dumb because that bitch was 450 <laughs> feet in stands. I was like, we got a five nothing lead. Who gives a shit? It's a crazy stat, and honestly, it's something, in my opinion, that's never going to get broken. Which is like kind of like a, a badge of honor you can kind of hold yourself to. But it's <laughs> it, it, so what, what? What like stems that you 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 like said with the the statistics and the odds and all that kind of stuff? But honestly, I think in your mind, and you could say all this about the fucking percentages, all that shit. You just hate fucking giving guys free bases. Like, I, I can't simple. stand it. I can't <laughs> fucking stand it. Earn it my base. <laughs> There's nothing fucking worse than say, telling somebody, I'm fucking scared of you. True. That's that's my opinion. I'm fucking scared. No. No, I'm not. Hit this bitch. And they do hit it sometimes, though. I'll be honest. They hit the piss out of it. But my, 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 my thing was, I don't want you just to just have a freebie. I never got a fucking freebie when I was no, no, you don't you don't either. I don't get to sit here and say, you know what, I don't I don't get to throw a pitch here. I don't get to throw a pitch. I'm gonna sit here and wait till you just take your base. But fuck that. I have to challenge you. I have to throw that ball that way no matter what. I have to. Yeah. And I did my my thing was, and you have to swing. And if you don't, if you're, if you're not gonna swing, I'm gonna strike you out. It's a good it's a good mindset to have. And one thing that you mentioned that like just having that fuck you mentality in the mound is is I, I could be wrong on this, but in 2017, I believe, credit to me for doing my research, fucking big brain, Juco brain. In 2017, hey, Juco, I love Juco. I'm a Juco. Exactly. I'm a Juco brain. <laughs> so in 2017, Terry Francona said that you got major league balls. When you hear a guy of that stature, a guy of that fucking a major league legend, Hall of Famer, everything you want to call it. When a guy like that says you got major league balls, does that does that trump every single accomplishment you've had in your career? Just having that guy's like acknowledgement that you're a fucking dog. Yes, it does. <laughs> it, it, I, I actually have that. I'm pretty sure I have that saved in my phone some point, um, somewhere. It hearing that from a guy like Tito was. He never said it to me. He said to the said to media, which which was kind of I was like, what the shit did he just say? Never said it to you. <laughs> no, never said it to me. Um, but it was it was just refreshing to hear it more than anything else because a lot of guys will, a lot of managers, a lot of, and I'm not saying all managers are like this, but a lot of managers are like, you know what? He should have just took the, you know, he could have he could have pitched around this guy. He could have done this. He could have done that. And don't get me wrong. There's times of doing that, right? But. I think what Tito was referring to is in an age where everybody's throwing as hard as they fucking can. And trust me, I try to throw every pitch as hard as I can. It just doesn't come out like that because it has a parachute attached to it. Um, and I still, I'll, I'll say this, to, this is my competitive major coming out. And I tell Mitchell this all the time. 
I can out long, I can out long toss Medrin. I can throw harder than Medrin throwing program. But when I get on the mound, someone puts a parachute in the back of my ball and not his, and it just comes out 88 or 90, maybe 90. But what hearing what I think he was referencing was, I in a in an age where everybody's throwing 95 plus, I was out there at 88, 89, pitching well, pitching pretty decent. I wasn't pitching great. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm never going to win a Cy Young. I'm never going to go in the Hall of Hall of Fame, or even the Hall of Very, Very Good, or Hall of Average for that matter. I was probably below average, but I knew what my role was on that team. My role was to eat as many innings as I possibly could. I wasn't going to have a sub one ERA. I fucking knew that. I knew I knew who I was. Yeah. I was never going to be a number one either. My job was, and hell, I, there was times where I'd go my bullpen days. I'd go throw a couple innings out of the pen for the team so that guys could have rest, or we could have set guys up for weeks in advance. Because my job, and I truly believe this, and I truly believe this is and also a dying breed, my job was to do what I could for the front of my jersey, not the back. And I still believe that to this day. And I still believe that a majority of the, of the league thinks that way. But it's just you don't get paid that way, right? You don't get paid for being a fucking dog anymore. You get paid for hitting, num- hitting numbers or incentives or, um, you know, having more walks or having more strikeouts per nine than – than everybody else or I, I don't know, man. It's just a, I, I do. I took a lot of pride in when he said that because he plays with one of my, he managed one of my favorite players ever walked the face of the earth and Dustin Pedroia. And goat, the goat. No, dude, whenever I hear him compare me to a guy like him, to me, that was the greatest honor of any, like respect to my teammates, admiration for my teammates and hearing a manager of that stature say something like this is the reason I play the game. Period. In the win, obviously win. Dude, it's like when you're getting compared to, in my opinion, if obviously with the injuries, a guy in my kind of like Brady, Grady Sizemore, man, a guy that a career was was made short because of injuries, but this guy still left such a massive legacy. World Series MVPs. The guy was on the cover of MLB The Show, and me being yeah. a short guy, five foot nine, some people who like to churn me say it. I used to look at fucking yeah. Dustin Pedroia, and I'd be like. All right, like all right, yeah, there's guys yeah, like me. Some of that, there's, there's guys like fucking me out there that could do that shit, man. So he was he was the guy that would like just give hope to all the short kings like me out there. So shout out Dustin oh, Justin, Pedroia. I was in a rotation with Ubaldo, Justin Masterson, and Derek Law. Guys that were six, seven, and beyond. And I'm five fucking eleven. <laughs> I, I actually, I'll say six foot. Fuck it, I'm six foot. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. You will say you're six foot. Derek Lowe, by the way, that guy is he played on the Jays a little bit. He had like a little stint with the Jays. He's a tall motherfucker. I mean, oh, dude, and sneaky fuck. nasty. Sneaky he's, fucking yeah. really good career. He's this guy. And that this is my thing. Like, and this is just my dumb brain looking at it. When a guy like that, when a guy like that, or a guy like Nate Pearson, another friend of the show, humble brag, name drop. When these guys oh, yeah, are like throwing it. on the fucking mound, when I'm watching this on TV, I'm like, all right, this isn't that hard. But it, when you see that in person, because he's so tall, it just looks natural that he's throwing hard. It just looks mm-hmm. natural. When you see these guys throw in person, there's just a little bit of an extra zip that some guys don't have. It's just, right. they're disgusting. It's insane. Nowadays, they call it spin rate, but we used to call it life. It has yeah. life. It has different gear. It's just weird. Like, I, my, favorite, my favorite view, I think, growing up watching was whenever they have the bullpen cameras, they'd watch a guy warming up, and it'd be, you'd see a guy throw, and you're like, holy shit. Like, it looks hard on TV means it's hard in person, right? Yeah. And it's, it was just phenomenal to me to watch. I, I was a baseball junkie growing up, still am. But I love watching, like that's that's probably what, that's probably what tickles my fancy for lack of a better fucking term than anything else is watching. Our, our bullpen we had this year and in, in, in three years I was in Atlanta was absolutely fucking, it was just it's a breath of fresh air because Atlanta plays old school. They, they yeah. we started shifting left and right um, in the about halfway through the year, All Star break, we started overshifting like crazy. But we have old school players, man. Travis D, Travis D, Freddie, Ozzy, Dansby, Austin Riley. I'm not I, Ronnie. I'll name them all. We have, coming from old school with Nick Marcakis, playing with that guy was a, a, one of the pure joys of my life as well. But and then you have like guys like Magic Mentor, um, Luke Jackson, um, Will Smith. All those guys on the bullpen, right? That were Jesse Chavez in the world. Like those guys, fucking get it. They they get it. They know that if you if you truly give a shit about the guy to your right and your left, and they truly give a shit about you back, and the only thing we're we, we we're doing today is try to be one fucking run better. That it makes it fun to play. 
it really truly does make it fun to come to the ballpark every single day, knowing you have a chance to win and you have a chance to go, go into a baseball game that can pitch your balls off with some of your best friends. And that, I mean, that's all you can ask for. And that, that's what we did. And that's the reason why we won the fucking World Series. Yeah. And you mentioned Jesse Chavez, actually. He, we actually had him on the show, like, I think two years ago when he was with the Texas Rangers. It might have been last year, actually. But that's another guy that's, like, old school, man. He doesn't give up. He doesn't throw gas. Like, he doesn't throw harder than other guys in the bullpen. He's just that finesse guy that found his way. And you mentioned the yeah. old school. He's a probably – that guy probably has stories as well. I mean, he, he told us a couple like meeting Hank Aaron, all that kind of stuff going back to the Braves. But that's another guy, like you mentioned journeymen in the show that have just seen some shit, understand every situation. He was such a massive part of that bullpen. Oh, huge part of that bullpen. And that's, you know, we talked about this um, when I got put on the DL and um, when they started making playoff rosters and stuff, we started talking about this kind of stuff. And I told, I told, um, um, Jesse came up to me actually and asked me, he's like, um, you're not on the playoff roster. Well, I was like, listen, dude, I'm not good right now. I haven't been good in a while. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't been pitching very well. Put it that way. When my shit pushed in. I'm not very good. When you came up from AAA, you were better than me. And you had the role that I had. You deserved that fucking role. You, you, exactly. you, you, beat, you beat me out. I mean, if I say beat me out, you pitched better than I did. So you got the more prominent roles than I have. And don't ever ask me if I'm upset or anything like that. Like, I want what's best for this freaking team going forward, and you're the best option we have right now, period. I learned a lot from Jesse Chavez. I'll be honest with you. He's a, he's a, a ball to play Call of Duty with, for one. And he's just he's, he gets it. He's a lot like me in the sense of we don't throw hard, but we don't walk, guys. And we will not walk, guys. We'll challenge you to, to, to we're dead. <laughs> and that's just how we were. Right. And I remember watching Jesse, and I still ask Jesse about this all the damn time. And I've been trying it this offseason. Day games, Jesse doesn't throw. Wow. Like, How the hell? Yeah. He doesn't throw? He doesn't throw. He doesn't play catch. Wow. He gets to the ballpark, he goes and takes a little nap, then he gets his coffee and walks on the bullpen. When he gets down to the bullpen, he'll get on the mound, he'll throw 10 or 15. And 10 or 15, he's letting loose. Don't get me wrong. He's not just up there going, I'm just eye washing this bullshit, playing catch because I have to. He's getting after a little bit. And then the phone will ring 30 minutes later. Hey, Jesse, you're up. He's on the mound throwing. I'm like, how in the hell does he do that? And I, we still talk about that. Like, how the, how the shit can you go into a game not knowing how you feel? He's like, I just rely on the, my instincts and my, 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 what I've done in the past. I, it'll be there. I have, I have 15, 20 pitches to get loose in the bullpen. Then I have eight on the mound. I'll figure out what, what shit's working and what's not. And he's dead nuts. It's true. He's he's a legend, and, and and he is a legend. A couple things I want to bring up about that team because there's you've seen a lot of guys hit, you've seen all this stuff during your time. Is Ronald Acuna the greatest baseball player that, in your opinion, you've ever played with or against or have seen live? Because people like obviously he wasn't a part of that World Series run, so it, it, it was kind of in the back of a lot of people's minds. But I'm just trying to remember people, remind people this guy's maybe the best player in baseball besides oh. Otani. I guess you could say it all that stuff, but he's. So exciting to watch. He plays the old style, like the fuck you mentality. He's yeah. just such a joy, man. I love Ronald Acuna. Oh, I love Ronald Acuna too. He's, 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 he might be the most dynamic player, electrifying player that I've ever played with in a sense of he could lay a bunt down and hit a fucking, hit a double or lay a bunt down and lug it out for a double or first pitch of the game hit it 480 to right field, left field, center field. It doesn't fucking matter. He did. There's no ballpark in the league that can hold Ronald Acuna. And Ronald Acuna is not a big dude by any means. He's not, he's not a, you know, he's not ripped. He's not shredded. He means put together. Don't get me wrong, but his fast twitch and explosiveness. Oh my God. Watching him. I remember when I first was like, holy shit, this dude's going to be, he's a different level. We were in Washington. He's hitting balls in the second, third deck to right center field in BP. And those balls aren't juiced in BP. Like, contrary <laughs> to what people believe, they are juiced in the game. Yeah, They are not juiced in BP. And he's hitting balls that left-handed guys, left-handed pool hitters aren't hitting up there. It was fucking unreal. We're, we, to the point where in BP, we're, we're kind of like watching, like, oh shit, like watching balls coming out. <laughs> we're sitting here watching how far these damn balls go. It's absolutely incredible. He's He's a different. He's a different type of player that um, the game needs right now. This is the second last thing I want to bring up here. 
So obviously you, you got to face a lot of hitters in your career. Grizzle, that just a just a brick by brick blue collar guy on the bump. Who's the hardest the hardest hitter you've ever played against? Or like a guy where it's whenever he steps in the box, you're like, I can't fucking buy buy an out <laughs> on this guy. I'm gonna age myself a little bit more here. Wilson Benjamin is one. I swear to God, Wilson Benjamin's hitting 800 in his career against me. Got to be. Um and uh Salvador Perez. Salvi. You know, Tito made a joke with me one time. I think um, um, I think it was a year that he tripped down the stairs and tore his ACL, um, or something happened. And Tito, Tito was making fun of me like he's got a broke femur on the dugout. He's in pants right now, Josh. He's gonna get crutches to come up here and pinch it off by you from pitch today. <laughs> like, and he'll probably take you deep on the one leg. And I said you're probably right, but it didn't matter with that dude, man. I could throw him anything I wanted, have him set up for the best breaking ball and execute the best breaking ball thrown all year long. And the dude golfs it for 450 feet. It's he's just so like, he was, he's awesome. And Wilson Benjamin would hit, he would hit seven, eight, or nine against any other pitcher that was starting that day or that series. And when I would, when I would pitch, he would hit one, two, or three. And I didn't, re- I didn't notice it at the beginning. Then Brantley, I think Brantley or Kipnis or somebody brought it up to my attention one time. He's like, hey, dude, why the fuck is Benjamin hitting one, <laughs> hitting leadoff today? I'm, like, what are you talking about? Might be, he's like, yeah. He hits leadoff against you every single time. You realize that, right? So he gets more bats. I was like, he's sons of bitches. But they, they were right. He just owned me, man. He absolutely freaking owned me. Everyone has those guys, though. I mean, and this is this, – actually, this is the second last thing because Matzik mentioned this to me. He wanted me to bring it up. So, obviously, you train with A.J. Minter. And A.J. Minter, like you said, he has the mullet. He has all that kind of shit. Who would you say has better hair in their prime? And you could be unbiased. You, oh, dude, AJ me. Minter. If you ask it, me or him, if that's even a question. Because, dude, you're, you're flowing. I watched this, and I watched, and I, obviously I did, I did my research, credit to me. There's a game you pitched. You had 11 punchies, and the, and the announcers are just fucking jerking you off. Like, they're like, this guy's nasty. <laughs> yeah, Your hair was holy fuck. I mean, if there oh, was – if Twitter and everything was popping off back then, you want to talk about likeliness, you would have been buzzing. So, <laughs> so it's just done. So that, so you tell that to AJ Minter too. Like you're oh, you, all the you time. His ass. Oh, all the time I do. I was telling Minter when he was growing his hair out, I'm like, you got to get a mullet. And then I realized he had some baldness <laughs> going on, like some really thinning hair. I said, no, no mullet. You can't do it. He's like, I'm fucking doing it. And I said, dude, you can't. He did it. And don't get me wrong. He has a hat on. It's beautiful. But he has to perm it. I never had to perm my shit. My shit just naturally just elite, like, elite sat shit. perfect, right? It sat perfect. And Mintz didn't. He has to perm it and stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I love his letters. I absolutely love it. He's got, he's got this hockey hair now. And I think it's, it's, I think it's freaking phenomenal. But um, our bullpen catcher in uh, Cleveland, Ricky, he, uh, he, um, I told him one day, I said, hey, I want a mullet. And he's like, you want a mullet? I said, yeah, I want that European style mullet. Like the whole, like, it kind of fades up there. The hard part, if you want it, I said, I want it to look sick, but I want it to be like a hockey mullet. That's what I, I, I want it to be a hockey mullet. He's like, done. He did it. And I wish I had my phone back then when he first did it, but it was the best haircut I've ever got in my life, maybe. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Um, but I loved it. I came home, my wife was like, Carly was like, what the hell is that? I said, this is, this is done. I'm, this is sticking with me forever. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to have a mullet forever. <laughs> she was like, no, no, you're not. Yes, I am. So I went to a, um, I went to a, um, um, God dang, I can't think of the name of the foundation right now. Um, Andre Knott with Cleveland does a um, cancer um, or a um, autistic um, foundation. And I was at this foundation. We were taking pictures of some kids. And I had my head down here. I was talking to some kids. And someone was taking a picture of us. I didn't have a hat on. And I could just, it was like this right here right now, all the way. But I had hair. It was just like, it looked like, like noodles almost, like stringy yeah. ass noodles on top of my head. And I said, holy shit, I got to get rid of this stuff. And that was the beginning of the end for my mom. R.I.P. R.I.P. Rest in peace to the legend. And this is the yeah, last thing here. And obviously, it. since you're my guy now, this might be, is this the is this the first podcast you've done, or have you done another one before this? Can we say this is the first one you've done? Baseball wise, yes. I, I did one with a buddy of mine, uh, Jason Wright. He has um, it's called the Jason Wright Show. I have done one with him. Okay, I so want to we'll do my own podcast. Dude. I want to fucking I want to. This is awesome. I'll, I like co- this. I'll co-host this shit, and you want to talk about. And this is why I think this <laughs> podcast is great, is because. 
a lot of guys, and obviously you don't realize this, you'll realize they'll realize this once their career is done, like I do with mine. This gives me that sense of joy, like when I used to be in locker rooms, just talking shit with the boys. Like that's what this podcast is, and that's why I think no it's doubt. so great. Humble brag. That's why I think it's so great. But it just you're it's shooting the shit with the boys, man. So like that's why I think this is so good. And and obviously going into your career. Can we get the exclusive rights on your retirement? Maybe the next team you play for? Let me break the fucking news. Sorry, Jeff Passan. Sorry, Ken Rosenthal. Let me break this shit. Let me Damn right. go I will. viral on this. No, oh, fuck yeah. Hit Zoom. Yeah. Well, we'll go by, I'll fly down to Texas. I'll fly down to Texas. We'll do all fucking, like I said, I, I, I'm not a cowboy boot guy. I will wear cowboy boots, hat. <laughs> I'll pack the biggest dip you'll ever fucking see. And we'll just, uh, we'll break the internet. We'll announce it right. We'll announce it. We'll get it right. I love it. I'm, I'm in. I'm you love fucking in. You love to see it. Like I said, you heard it here first. So, and, and if any other publication tries to announce Josh Tomlin retirement, they can go fuck themselves. It's us first. <laughs> we get the yes. exclusive rights. Unless, and honestly, I'm trying to poach you here. Maybe uh, the Jays bullpen kind of needs some work if you want to kind of take a trip down to uh, the six and maybe maybe, maybe hey, offer I, your talents. I, I've talked to Ross and Mark, not during the lockout, obviously, but hey, Ross and Mark, I've known them from Cleveland back in the day. I've known them really well. I need to be a Blue Jay. I love Ross, dude. I mean, and obviously he get, and everyone gives him a bad rap because Alex Anthopoulos was here. He's that kind of the, the sweetheart of Toronto because he picked up David Price, Troy Tulowitzki. But don't get Ross wrong. I mean, this Jays young team, in my opinion, and I'm a gambling guy, I'm a degenerate. They have one of the highest odds, the best odds to win the World Series. They have one of them. So obviously the analytics are saying some shit that they're just pumping my tires here. But oh, they're, I'm, no, they're good. I'm fired they're up. Very, for very it, man. good. I'm for, so so what, what are your plans for next year? Obviously, you're still throwing with AJ Minter, all that kind of stuff. So we'll finish the episode with like, what, what are your plans and goals going into next year? Uh, if, we, if, this, if this shit ends up or ends pretty quick, I, I plan on playing. I do. Um, it's hard for me. I'm at a, I'm at a stage in my life now where my kids, like they understand what going to baseball means. It means I'm going to be gone for a while. Yeah. Um, and they have their own life now. They're seven and six and two. My seven year old, my six year old, they, they cheer. They, um, um, they're in school. They, they do cheer. They have competitions. We have a competition this weekend in Houston. Like they, they love, they love it. I, I, I've watched them go cheer. And it, I have chills in my whole body right now thinking about this. I see the same passion that I have for baseball. Like, it, it's in them, right? They, they love it. They love to compete. They love everything about it. They're practicing. That My kids are more on their hands doing flips in my, my living room or going to bed or walking upstairs than they are on their feet. That, that They just absolutely adore it. And for me to say, hey, daddy's going to baseball. We're all going to pick up and go would be – I don't think it's fair to them, right? I, I, I just don't, I don't think it's fair. They have a life here. They have friends. They have everything going on that's theirs. I'm not going to take that that joy away from my kids to take them to a different city to go basically start over. If I'm going to go play, it's going to go, I'm going to go play, play, do my thing. They're going to come up on the weekends, things like that. But um, my kids have pretty, I've pretty much made it pretty, pretty adamant about, Daddy, we don't want you to play baseball anymore. And then, so I said, okay do one more year of it and that but don't get me wrong they they they're more than happy they love watching baseball they love everything about it. my my sons absolutely eat up with it i can send you videos of him hitting baseball as a two-year-old right now hitting further than some of these got lead off guys in the big leagues now but um it's like i don't know man like that if, if it's going to hinder my relationship with my kids and my wife then i would i would retire right now might have a great support system. My wife and kids are freaking phenomenal. They would do anything in the world to make my dreams come true. Um, and at some point, I understand that my job is going to be to take a back seat to this shit and to, and sooner, maybe sooner rather than later with all this bullshit going on with baseball, the, the owners ruining the game, it's going to have to be, I take a back seat to my dreams and it's about focusing on what their dreams are going to be. Yeah, and but I you, can't also, you, that chapter, you but. also don't want to be at the point where you're kind of older and you're like, to the point where it's like, um, I still had a little bit of juice in the tank. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to, reti- right. you don't want to retire yep. a year too early or two years too early. And listen here, I'm not pitching the Blue Jays here, but y- I mean, you you have a World Series ring right there, so maybe you could bring that little shit going on there to the Blue Jays clubhouse, get the boys going. Your kids are gonna love Toronto. I mean, let don't, let's uh, not give it a break. It's the best city on the planet, right? I, just one of them. There ain't no doubt about it. <laughs> there's no doubt about it. 
Well, anyways, man. Well, anyways, man. Like I said, I mean, I had to get this done, and obviously, we've had grizzled vets on the podcast, but the people are gonna fucking love this one. I like just how outspoken you are. You let this shit fly, and that's why we're gonna start a podcast someday. It's gonna be called just morale guys or or locker room guys, where we just (laughs) get the boys on it, just straight locker room banter, no preset questions, just getting the boys going. And I'm sure you can bring. Yeah. I'm sure you can bring like a couple that. of guests. I'm sure you can bring a couple of guests that are just big time. <laughs> Andrew Miller, ever heard of him? But no, it's just like I said, man, it was a pleasure to have you on. You're le- like I said, I said this before and you corrected me. You're actually our legend of the game. 12 years in the show. Not many people on planet Earth that have walked this planet have done that shit. So maybe at one well, point you kind of that. step back and be like, dude, maybe I am a legend because 12 years in the big leagues and counting is something that. I, a small, not even a, a fraction of a percentage of the world is done. So thank you for doing this, brother. You're electric. Well, I appreciate that, Johnny. You say you're just as electric, just in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, man. No, but uh, yeah. So.